Hello strategy gaming enthusiasts, my name is Alzebo HD. In today's challenge video, we will set out along the Silk Road and attempt to take a Sino-Tibetan tribe across the Rubicon and into the heart of ancient Rome. Migrating from Asia and the periphery of the known world, we will seek to use our people's liberation levies to subjugate the Senate and forge a Sino-Roman Empire, but taking on the superpower of the ancient world as a primitive polity will be far from easy. For us to make Rome our imperator home, we'll be playing as the Tibetan tribes of the Sumpa state. This crude clan is not the largest or most populated upon the plateau, but it is the closest country to China, which is unplayable. Their legacy is that of the Qiong, a people that hail from the spicy corridor that separates tribal Tibet from the Han in 304 BC, making them Chinese as per PRC decree. With Iron Man mode activated, it's time to start this alternative history mockumentary and explore what would happen if China made Rome their new imperial home. But before we get started, this video is sponsored by Marvel Strike Force. Marvel Strike Force is a mobile squad RPG where you can play as Morbius and assemble a dream team of Marvel characters to save the universe. Strategy gaming enthusiasts will feel right at home with the team-based tactics, and assembling your squad is more important than ever during the 5v5 battles against the greatest villains of the Marvel Universe. Whether you go solo in campaign mode or take the fight to the multiplayer PvP arena, Marvel Strike Force is a cinematic and visually stunning mobile experience. New characters are constantly being released, and this month be on the lookout for the Hivemind team. Support Alcebo HD and download Marvel Strike Force today for free by using the QR code on screen or via the link in the description box below. With the special code cards, you can also unlock Gambit, 500 power cores, and 5 premium orbs, so be sure to download Marvel Strike Force today. Now that we're back in 304 BC, the Sumpa start off their campaign as a settled tribe that isn't capable of migration. So the first step of our nation will be to abandon our sedentary lifestyle, which can only be done by taking our centralization to negative 25% or lower. Adopting human sacrifices will take us there slowly and surely, but while we wait, we'll consult our tribal elders. If we took all of Tibet, we could have more people to migrate, so peace was never an option, and Sumpa set out to secure the population of the plateau. Yahlong yearned for liberation, and the capital of Chong was quickly captured in under a year, but the neighboring nation of Tsong joined the conflict, turning it into a two-front war. With twice their population and an army twice as large, Tsong didn't stand a chance, and after two more years of fighting, the war was over. Sumpa had now secured the Eastern Tibetan Plateau in its entirety, but centralization was slow coming, so socialism with Chinese characteristics would be passed for the common good, while humans were sacrificed for stability. During this liminal period, our Lama dallied out his time in Lhasa by preparing his population for the upcoming migration. The various tribes and pops of the plateau were voluntold to move to centralized camps at great expense, as only provinces with our primary culture and religion would be eligible for future resettlement. In the court of our Tibetan king, an emissary from Etruria had arrived and informed our chief that he had fled the bitter wars of Italia in search of allies in the fight against the upstart Republic of Rome. Stories of a fertile land of farms, beaches, and olive oil captured the imagination of our impoverished barren nation, and the course had become clear. It was time to abandon our settled status and become a migratory horde, and our chief set out to accompany the Etruscan emissary by guiding his people through Asia and into the fertile lands of the Mediterranean. Transforming our nation of settled Sumpanese into a migratory army would not be quick or easy, and would require money to resettle pops into stacks of 20, before spending stability to create each stack of 10,000 militarized migrants. Not everyone was happy that they'd be forced out of their homeland, and our stability was sub-zero. But after six years of packing, only 10% of our original population of 200,000 were incapable of making the move on account of their religious or cultural status. This westward trek would take years and cost thousands of human lives, but it was time for us to go Imperator home and take our Sino-Tibetan tribe to the heart of Rome. 
Our combined forces of 88,500 migration units consisted of 177,000 men, women, and children. And in 288 BC, the order was made to move everyone in mass. To avoid attrition, these migrants were split into smaller units, and having arrived in Bactria, Hellenic technologies reforged our horde into a veritable fighting force. At this crossroads of empires, our tribe diverged into northern and western branches to ensure its survival, while our former home was sold off to the Nepalese for free, making our nation a migrant horde. Time was slipping into the future, and after four years, our people had hiked thousands of kilometers, passing through the divided realms of Alexander's once mighty empire. However, upon arriving in Europe, Rome had already grown far more than originally expected, but their wars with Gallic tribes presented a unique opportunity. The separatist state of Hadria had succeeded in seceding from the SPQR, but they could not have foreseen hundreds of thousands of hot singles arriving to mingle in the local area. What's more, Rome was now at war with Venice and Dalmatia, and was thus distracted, providing our tribe the chance of a lifetime. More than six years had passed since we left our Tibetan homeland, and only a few thousand civilians had perished on the journey. At this point, the Sumtanese were as subtle with their intentions as any army with tens of thousands of soldiers on a border could possibly be, but it was time for us to abandon our peaceful pretenses. Armed bellicosity would become our modus operandi, and in 281 BC, our chief called for a no-CB war with the goal of showing these Hadrians and their savage friends the power of Sumbanese supremacy. More than 100,000 Tibetan civilians poured into Italy, armed with only spears and wooden shields. The Hadrians had only known independence for two weeks and now had to cope with an Asian invasion and existential crisis they knew not existed. Their capital city of Hatria was taken in less than a year, and with fire purging the plebs from the province, 10,000 Tibetans settled within the ashes, making Hatria the city-state capital of the Sumpanese state. The indigenous Italians were thus displaced, and our culture and religion became the majority of this municipality, but the war was far from over. Our warriors laid waste to the western allies of Hadria, and subsequently settled the land, which in turn avoided the aggressive expansion penalties from conventional treaties. What little resistance remained was purged from the province of Parma, while the Tibetans manifested their destiny in and around their newly furnished crown capital. While we had our way with the Gallic and Italic tribes, the upstart Rome asked for military access which was promptly denied. This land was our land, and the Senate had no power here, so we'll settle what we can and people these provinces with Tibetan hands. To our north, the Alpine area was all but annihilated, but the Roman menace had reached Venice by boat and occupied the province in its entirety. In the face of this Roman aggression, we had no choice but to fully annex the Ratian realm, the baronies of Boi, and settle the remnants of Criminoia. In a little over three years, every Hadrian and allied barbarian were fully annexed and subjugated, and our Tibetan tribe of 167 pops, approximately 167,000 people, had found their new home in Cisalpine Gaul. Unfortunately, Rome had ravaged Venice and fully annexed the province, but a new war between Etruria and the Italic Republic presented a new opportunity. In keeping with the tradition of our people, this called for war, and with the Palpatine Hills under Etrurian occupation, our newly founded nation declared war on the SPQR with the goal of capturing Veneto. It was a boat time we built up a navy, and our newly established levies double teamed the Romans from above and below. Entire cities were enslaved and massacred, holy Hellenic sites were desecrated, and hell hath no fury like Asumpa scorned. With the power of mercenaries, the Roman auxiliaries were utterly outmatched, and Venice fell to our Sino-Tibetan tribe. Faced with Etrurians to the west and Asians to the north, Rome didn't stand a chance against the combined offensive, and their gods were thrown into the dustbin of history. The Roman capital itself was under siege, and despite our own lands falling under Latin occupation, the capital of the Romulan Republic had fallen and was pilfered and desecrated according to Chinese custom. 
Across the peninsula, the war was hard fought and our men were increasingly wary, but in due time, the Romans were expelled from our capital and crown provinces. The heavy toll of war had resulted in realm-shattering levels of war exhaustion, and in the face of military losses and attrition, our enthusiasm was curved and forced us to the negotiating table. Venice and the Roman capital would soon be Sumpanese, while Ancona was released as an independent nation. Under our protection, Rome was sacked and slaughtered for anything of value, but our exhaustion and aggressive expansion now necessitated a period of rest and repose while we licked the wounds of Rome's ruin. With the Italian capital now in our hands, we could sell off their infrastructure to fund the resettlement of our people and culture into the capital of Venice. The city was now the second Sumpanese metropolis and could further fund settlers to colonize the cities of Cisalpine Gaul. The Chinese are great at cultural conversion, and six cities had now assimilated into our primary culture as our superior society reigned supreme across northern Italy. The Sumpanese enticed commercial ventures to import goods made in China, but Rome was starving and we couldn't care less. Their leap forward would be to our benefit as we dedicated a holy site to the Tibetan deity of fertility and increased our population and assimilation capacity. Our lands were increasingly Sampanese and colonization provided extra population with ease and once our truce with Ancona expired it was time to press into the Italian peninsula. I wish I could say this war was worthy of mention, but it really wasn't, and in three weeks the enemy was so badly beaten that one of their cities disappeared from the map. We let the enemy sack Rome because of our disdain for plebs, and after they had their way with Romulus and Remus, we swooped in and ended the festivities. All of their base now belonged to us, and Ancoma was annexed in its entirety. Sino-Roman settlers of Tibetan origin would soon settle these lands, and by 262 BC, the plurality of our polity were of Asian persuasion. Stability is overrated, and with the Swiss rising against us, we brought fire and fury against their hearth and home as resistance is futile. The North African superpower of Carthage eyed our advances with great interest and offered us an alliance, but of course it was simply a ploy to lure us into some stupid war which we wouldn't engage with anyways. A friend in need is a friend indeed, but a friend that bleeds is better. Unfortunately for us, our so-called ally Carthage had the gall to decline our liberation of Gallic Insanubria, which left us solo in our quest to wrest control of Italia. Invading the Insubrians was so easy a caveman could do it, but their allies were numerous and our Sino-Romans were heavily outnumbered. Well, it doesn't really matter as quality outmatches quantity, and before long their capital was smote into an ashtray. The Proto-Genoese and Sovoyards were next on the chopping block, but they too were smited and their lands ignited. Our nascent navy made a gravy incursion into Massilia, and within four years it was all ogre. In Subria, Salacia, and Ilvasia now belonged to the legionaries of Sumpa Lumpa. These lands might not have been the lands of our fathers, but they would become the land of our daughters, and with a druidic Gallic majority, it was time to resettle the realm with true Tibetans. Our nation was still a migratory tribe, which means we can sacrifice our cities and population centers to send migrants to replace the savages within our conquered counties. In only two years after our last census, we now had a Tibetan majority, and the matter of Italia would soon be decided in Xiangyi's tradition. Rome and Etruria were at blows again, and the elders decreed that Italia must belong to Sumpa, so it's time to raise our banners and declare war on budget Rome to unite our country contiguously. Etruria is endangered in even ideal RNG situations, so when a player tag teams their territory with Rome, the results are entirely predictable. We'd kill their gods and none would hide as the die had been cast and we burned down three of their holy sites and sacked every single city. Sino-Tibetan hospitality would show these heathens a change of new management as almost every single settlement of theirs were revoked while simultaneously our own holdings were upgraded into cities. 
Any attempts at independence were met with forced eunuchification, as Chinese territorial integrity must maintain harmony. Free Rome was likely funded by the Carthaginian intelligence agency, and our mandate of heaven was increasingly uncertain. Much like the Aztecs, we'd sack our own subject populations for human sacrifice, but Romans were not human, as they lacked the civilization minimum. The Etrurian Fifth Column was next in the conga line of our people's liberation levies, but they too were fired as seditious sentiment swept across Sumpa. As an unreformed tribe, we can actually harvest our own former citizens for political influence, and despite a close call with our capital under siege, an ordered assault on Ravenna tanked this moment of liberty as harmony was restored to Dai Qin Zhongguo. These unruly children would have Sumpanese install themselves into their homes, Play bon. The threat of Rome and double Rome was never far from home, so our chief chairman ordered the vanquished to volunteer themselves for levy duty and prepared for Sino-Roman War II, Tibetan Boogaloo, as we are yak on the attack. According to the ancient Nine Dash line, both Romes belonged to the Zhou dynasty and our terracotta troopers rolled in for an easy win. Every single city would pay the iron price of pillaging and plunder, but despite our rapid advances, the Romans had a death stack of 52,000 soldiers. We'd have to change our strategy, and rather than face them head on, had our men split the enemy into separate stacks. This is the art of war, though not even Sun Tzu could have predicted the Roman slaves to revolt and be smote by their own countrymen. Dividing and conquering the Latin legions proved to be the solution for our peninsular problem, and with Italy undefended, Subanese spies flowed downstream. Rome's enthusiasm for war had waned, but they still possessed twice as many soldiers, so we'll take what we can and return later for takeout leftovers. It's 228 BC, and nearly a quarter of our 2,200,000 population were properly Chinese. A vacation on the islands of Corsica resulted in military annexation, and we will assimilate the enemy by adding their biological and technological distinctiveness to our own. An alliance with the Greek Macedonians now meant that olive oil was back on the menu, and besides replacing Roman temples with parking lots, this fourth Sino-Roman War was being chillin'. Sicily and Syracuse were sacked, and a separate peace procured southern Sicilia for our bone brethren. As for Rome, their home in Italy would be relegated to Calabria, and simultaneously their separatist scum were converted into fertilizer for our fields. Everyone knows that the Sino-Roman state is the best Roman state, so it's time to respect our elders and elect our state a supreme leader. Our northern Roman regime now had a clean slate with which to replace heathen faiths and beliefs with our own cult of personality. Dr. Shaim Kai, the current chairman of the Sino-Roman state, was thus elevated to the status of godhood and became a deity of culture and forced assimilation. His favored fiefdom of Corsica was thus dedicated as his holy shrine, but during a routine campaign into Germania, our god king left the mortal realm due to chronic inflammation. Our centralization was nearly enough to reform into a monarchy, so we'll embrace absolute authority, recruit Latin mercenaries, and set out to deport Rome from Italy in its entirety. Unfortunately, we had a tendency to exterminate the territories we sought for Sumpa, and at this point, our Roman rival had fallen and was unable to resist our advances. 90% of Sicily would thus slide into Sino-subjugation, while the Roman nation was itself expelled from the continent and relegated to a Balkan reservation. The time of migration had come to a close, and our state opted to embrace a tribal kingdom, but our aggressive expansion presented an existential crisis to our ascendant autocracy. Rebellions were running rampant, and we have a hundred more years to go, so naturally it's time for a montage, as Sicily was subjugated and claims on Illyrian Rome were obtained. Our boys were brought in by boat and captured the Greco-Roman capital, leading to the annexation of Dalmatia and Epirus into our Sino-Roman nation. Bohemia were the next to be broken, and after three years of grueling guerrilla warfare, our final eastern borders were established in Austria. 
Tribal reform was sweeping our nation. Sardinia was smashed and grabbed from Carthage, and absolute rule was declared in 171 BC, making the Sumba Roman monarchy enshrined within the Sukor dynasty, itself elevated from tribal obscurity to the seat of ultimate power. Constant revolutions and uprisings were tearing apart our nation. Cultural dissemination began to turn everyone Chinese, and our capital was starving under the great leap forward towards the future. Country roads would thus lead to Hatria. The passing of the Royal Guard Law meant that the Yak Enforcement Squad became our permanent military, and there were like 15 more uprisings while we sped ahead at speed 5, with our ultimate goal being the indoctrination of every pop into the Bon religion and Tibetan culture. Druids had no place in our polity, and Vocantian lands marked our final western border. Our king died from eating a particularly rotten herring, and Hatria became a metropolis of over 175,000 people. This Sino-Roman state needed a great wonder worthy of our majesty. I spent like three real-life hours moving pops around to produce a Sumpanese majority in every Italian province. That was pretty annoying. And at last, the plug of Hatria had been completed, reminding the realm forever of how much a pain in the Asina it was to assimilate everyone into our Sino-Roman syncretic culture and faith. In 630 AUC, better known as 124 BC, the Sumpanese Tibetan realm is the preeminent superpower of the ancient world. If each pop is taken to be 1,000 people, our nation has 5,378,000 citizens, of which 2,400,000 are of Sino-Tibetan persuasion. Nearly 90% of them worship the Bon indigenous Tibetan religion, and approximately 50% of all of our subjects are of Sumpanese Asian ancestry. Every holy site not belonging to Bon has been burned away, and seven holy sites dedicated to our faith are fairly proportioned throughout the polity, with that of Corsica worshipping our eternal leader and deified god Datserheim the German. When looking at a map adjusted for population, nearly every European province with people belongs to the Sino-Roman Imperium, with our capital in Hatria hosting 214,000 people, which is by far the most populated polity in the ancient world. Nurkya Sekur I is the reigning Raja and heir of the Roman Empire, himself the 13th ruler and hailing from a long line of tribal chieftains before him. We've come a long way from our Chinese Qiang homeland, and the only remnant of the formerly august SPQR lies in a reservation in Greece, a sad Byzantine stain on an otherwise flawless campaign. Further abroad, the only nation that could be considered a near equal is Carthage, as they control all of North Africa and southern Iberia, though there also exists a unified Britain under Britannia, a supersized Macedonian Thrace, a substantial presence of Iberians and Armenians, an indigenous Egyptian dynasty, and a Marian empire clinging to life in the face of the Cholani Tamil kings. With all that said, this campaign was incredibly fun to play, which brings me to a proposition. If you want to see this video converted into CK3 and continued into the medieval world, be sure to like this video and let me know in the comment section below. Surprisingly, almost everything transferred over flawlessly, but our leader is a 140-year-old Sumba Loomba, and every member of our dynasty is between the ages of 200 and 130. This guy is married to a Gagiga Gilf, and honestly, I'm up to the challenge. Support Alzebo HD for free by liking the video and subscribing to the channel, and if you are financially endowed, consider supporting the channel on Patreon or by becoming a YouTube channel member. Salve and critetes de linda est.